Little note from Editing Sarah here. Editing Sarah is a little bit annoyed because a bunch of different small sections of audio for this episode got eaten somehow. I think Audacity was playing up while I was recording. I've done my best to cut around those areas and, where possible, re-record part of what I was saying. Uh, so I hope it isn't too noticeable, but I did want to apologise for the bad quality of sections of this episode. Um, I'm going to try and work out how that happens so it doesn't happen again, but I think it just boils down to needing a new computer, so uh, I'm going to try and work around that as much as possible. In the meantime, please enjoy the episode, and I'm going to go and review other episodes to make sure that this hasn't happened elsewhere. Today we're going to be looking at a new author, Michelle Kreese, who wrote the novel Hexed, uh, a teen novel, which I found, I have no idea where, probably a charity shop or a car boot sale judging by the condition of it um but it's called hexed and it's by michelle Kreese. the blurb for this book is a stolen book a deadly plan a destiny discovered indigo blackwood has it made a popular cheerleader with a football star boyfriend and a social circle powerful enough to ruin everyone at school who wouldn't want to be her but when a sexy stranger named bishop enters indy's world she learns that the fate of every witch on the planet is in her hands and that's seriously bad news for indy because according to bishop she's a witch too forced into a centuries-old war between witches and sorcerers indy's life just got way more complicated now i picked this up basically because it looked like it was going to be kind of an easy read uh being a, a teen novel and kind of fantasy fiction ish and i feel like i'd done a lot of the more magical realism side of things so i was trying to balance it out a teeny bit um but unfortunately i didn't end up liking the book very much and we'll get into why that was as we go through uh, i just want to say like off the top of it that although i didn't really enjoy it that much it still had enough mystery and interest in it to get me to read very quickly to the end which I'm doing this thing now where because reading everything is getting kind of overwhelming and I'm sick of plowing through bad books if a book hasn't got my interest if I don't want to keep reading by page 40 I just throw it into a separate pile and I'm going to do a video on that did not finish pile at a later date but uh, this book was interesting enough for me to finish it so it's got that going in its favour and I feel like for younger readers it might be a bit more interesting but uh we'll get into the plot so the improbably named indigo blackwood is that stereotypical misfit in her social clique because although she's one of the popular girls she also has thoughts and opinions and interests of her own which makes her special uh, her mum is kind of an embarrassment to her because she runs a witchy shop and her mum is kind of a hardcore wiccan and obviously that comes off as very weird to people in the school uh, she also has this book like her mom has this book which she freaks out if she loses it and she once found it buried in the yard so um that's a little odd uh, but aside from that she's your perfectly normal average teenage girl until she isn't now i noticed on goodreads a lot of the people who gave this book a negative review kind of didn't like indy as a character and they thought that she was kind of bitchy and mean due to events in the novel i think she kind of has a right to be because spoiler alert and if you're going to read this book stop listening now but about halfway through the book her mum gets murdered so i think she has a right to be a little bit of a cunt to people but aside from that she is at least a spunky protagonist and i feel like after reading the whole like wicker series like the kate tiernan books i was kind of crying out for a teen protagonist who isn't passive af and she at least gets mad at people roughly speaking she doesn't really find out the truth about what's going on until page 130 of this 350 ish page novel and then doesn't actually learn how to do any magic until 258 so roughly 100 pages from the end of the novel so if, if you're looking for a slow burn magical novel where the main character doesn't actually gain magical powers for over halfway through i don't know why you'd want that but this is the book for you there's two different magical groups sorcerers and witches sorcerers when they come into their powers instantly know how to use all of them whereas witches have to learn um i don't know how that unfairness happened but there you go uh but the sorcerers kind of attack witches and kill them to steal their powers much like in the original charmed series to combat this a great big magical spell was done so that now if a sorcerer kills a witch they instantly lose all their powers and as deterrents go that's pretty good 
Unfortunately, the how this was done element was written down in a book called The Witch Hunter's Bible, which must now be kept out of sorcerers' hands because otherwise they'll work out how to get around it and be able to kill witches as much as they want again. This book was given to um, the main character Indigo's mother to look after uh, for the purposes of the novel and their sorcerer people are trying to get it and that's how her mum ends up being dead and all the threat starts to come out in the story. We also find out about the rules behind magical heritage and it's basically like all DNA you need two people with a special gene to come together and have children in order to get a witch which explains why um, Indigo's mother has no powers. She is still a Wiccan, she still believes in, in magic and spells but she doesn't have like active magical powers so that's kind of sad for her and uh, she also has a sister who they pretend is not a witch for a frustratingly long time. Indigo's social circle in the book is her boyfriend Devon who cheats on her with her best friend, her best friend who's an absolute bitch, the girl next door who really wants to be her best friend but who Indigo treats kind of atrociously and Bishop the witch guy who turns up with a neck tattoo of a naked Betty Boop and a terrible attitude but who's apparently the heartthrob of the book and really finds that fine line between you know sexy bad boy and sociopath because on the one hand he like turns up in a leather jacket and kind of relentlessly pokes fun at her in a way of like oh I'm pulling your pigtails because I like you except that's not a thing but on the other hand, he just keeps like making gross comments about her body and being really antagonistic and kind of mean, even, you know, after her mum's been murdered right in front of her. And doing things like when she needs clothes because for various reasons she's gotten like covered in sewage or had to like leave her formal dress behind because it was covered in sewage. He conjures her like booty shorts so she has half her ass hanging out. And he just comes across as a massive pervert and also kind of a dick. Now the core mystery element is that there has been a spell placed on the witch hunter's bible which means that even though the sorcerers get their hands on it that they can't actually open the book and they need someone related to the person who put the spell on it to take it off. So they target Indy because they're like well it was in your mum's possession it's clearly you know someone in your family put a spell on it. And she doesn't know who that was, but it has to be someone who's still alive because that's how spells work. So again, I give you her aunt who she just kind of goes like, she couldn't possibly a be a witch. She's too normal. She doesn't have her life together or anything. So it's kind of weak, but uh, OK. Uh, so basically the sorcerers keep coming after her and that would be fine if the sorcerers weren't simultaneously lame and hugely overpowered. Like there's a bit where she's like running through the streets and every time she stops the sorcerer is there and then he turns all of the pedestrians that she keeps running into into like zombies who like chase her and it feels like these guys have the power of God himself and yet they cannot successfully corner a teenage girl who only knows one spell. Indigo actually encounters the sorcerers once before her mother's death but doesn't remember it due to a memory wipe spell. But they come in and they summon her to the principal's office because they have magic mind control powers. Well, they can do that. And she refers to them as like Mr. Wolf and Scarface. That's who she refers to them as in her brain. But they are called Leo and Frederick. And um, they do a lot of kind of... They come off as very kind of greasy and over the top sinister. They kind of remind me of like evil guys in really shit supernatural TV series where they just show up and they're like, oh, I'm evil, I'm going to do evil shit for no readily apparent reason just because I'm bad. Uh, so, for example, he like reads her mind. He's like, oh, well, some people call me Mr. Wolf just to freak her out. And then the cherry on top of that shit cake is around page 44, 45. He starts talking, uh, Leo starts talking about the film Reservoir Dogs by Quentin Tarantino. And the like iconic torture scene in that. And he's like saying, oh no, we could do that to you. And that's how we could get like information out of you. Now, Reservoir Dogs came out in 1992. This book came out in 2014. So maybe you could have seen the Louise music video, which parodied that scene because of, you know, that stuck in the middle with you was the song that was used in it. But if you had seen the film in 1992 when it came out, 
Even assuming that you were born in that year, by the time it was 2014, you would be 22 and probably too old to be reading this book unless you have a witchcraft review podcast, in which case you have no life. So if someone was like old enough to watch it, so I guess like 18 then, like they're not going to be reading this book. They're not going to get that reference. It's really weird and out of place. And also having your evil guy come in and twiddle his evil moustache by going, oh, you know that famous torture film and that film that came out like years before you were born? What if we did that to you? Why describe it to you in detail and talk about how great that Tarantino film was? It just makes your characters look a little bit silly and foolish that they're just describing the plot of a movie to someone instead of, you know, actually trying to torture them. And the fact that it's a dated reference on top of that it just makes the whole thing weirder. It's also not the only dated reference that jumped out of me. And the second one was actually worse. Uh, another one happens on page 115. They are talking about, like, stuff happening. I forget what. But he said, uh, Bishop says, she's just pulling a Bella. A what? A Bella, you know, guy does you wrong. So you punish yourself by practically killing yourself. So that's obviously a reference to Twilight New Moon, which I did actually read when it came out. Um, but that book came out in 2006, I believe. I've Googled. Yes, 2006. The movie came out in 2009, which was five years before this book came out. And I know, obviously, you write references into books and then it takes a while for the book to get published. So it's not coming out, like, right away. But that's quite behind the zeitgeist. If you're, like, writing a book that's, I guess, meant to be set in, like, 2014 when it like, comes out or meant to be contemporary when it is released and it's referring to a teen movie that came out five years previously or, you know, a book that came out even longer into the past. Five years is kind of a long time for a teenage age group. They're going to be moved on to something else by then. In 2014, which is when this book was released, Mockingjay Part 1, so like the third movie of the Hunger Games series, came out. So did the Maze Runner movie, uh, The Fault in Our Stars, um, Divergent, you know, these big teen franchises that obviously a lot of people are into, um, but not Twilight. Twilight was like half a decade old at this point and although people are still into it those people tend to be you know in their late 20s now like what i am uh, and who uh, have either forgotten that dark period in their past or have embraced it and become twilight moms which um i don't know which is worse but you see what i mean also at one point she declines a call and she says her finger is hovering over the keypad and i'm like what phone had a keypad in 2014 you know when smartphones started to become popular even as early as 2009. So these may seem like little things, but it was really kind of odd and off-putting to be reading a book aimed at teenagers that smacked so much of, hello, fellow kids, it is I, a teen. And obviously teen fiction is not by and large written by actual teenagers, but it should be written by people who know what teenagers are interested in, surely. Um, which is just a little bit weird. Like when I was writing Wayward, which is my attempt at writing a teen novel, I wasn't that far out of my teens. I think I was 19 or 20. But even then I was making things like, oh, my teenage character was reading a magazine. And a friend, like uh, the younger brother of my best friend, Vanda, told me like, well, teenagers don't really read magazines. Like, especially not like teenage girl magazines because they have like Instagram and the internet now. They don't really need those things. So... Even being slightly over that age market, you do have to work very, very hard to stay on top of trends. And it felt like this book really didn't do that. And it kind of stuck out, particularly in those three instances that I've mentioned. Now, I've said quite a lot of negative book. And to be honest, I don't think that it's like an exceptional example of the teen fantasy book genre. But it is serviceable. It's competent. The writing, aside from that kind of weird out of time feeling, is good it gets its point across uh, although the references are quite dated there's a, an effort made to have the teenagers speak like normally there isn't a load of outdated slang in there so you can kind of forget about it um the fact that the main character's mum is killed partway through the book takes balls and i kind of admire the author for doing something like that and for showing a little bit of the grieving process um, I feel like that is kind of an interesting thing to attempt to do. 
Not enough time is given to it, in my opinion, but an attempt was still bravely made, and I salute it. Uh, also, I kind of like the idea of questioning the authority of the witches, because the, the witches are ruled by the family, and the sorcerers are ruled by the priory. Uh, and the family don't seem to be in evidence. They never come to help Indigo. It's it's just Bishop that's there, who's as essentially there on their orders. And his ex-girlfriend, who um, allows Indigo's mum to be murdered because she just flounces out of a conflict situation and is like, oh, well, whatever, I got mine. So you guys can just deal with this guy now. And then who lynches the murderer and laughs at his body like she's unhinged but um they're the only characters you see from the family and then at the end of the book indigo has realized some things about how the book that her mum was meant to be guarding was actually a decoy that the real book is somewhere else and that her mother was therefore left to kind of fend for herself protecting something that she thought was important with her life when actually everyone knew that it was rubbish except her so she gets really annoyed about that and i feel like that's interesting it kind of has that against authority thing going for it it was unfortunate that from like the shitty love interest character and some of the themes about like finding out that she's a witch and some of the lore reminded me of melvin burgess's the lost witch which i reviewed ages ago at this point but which wasn't a very good book and that was all that this reminded me of although this was substantially better um, because it didn't go into the weird places that that one did it still kind of reminded me of it and I felt like the whole lore behind the witches wasn't the most interesting it was kind of a little bit forced in a way that it felt like they felt they had to be original so they just went with a, a new take a new idea without really explaining it that well i feel like this book wasn't for me because obviously i'm not a teenager and even when this came out in 2014 i had finished my master's degree and was like working and living by myself so like clearly i'm not the target audience for this book but also it's weird that the references in it are things that line up with my teenage years which is kind of an odd feeling so Although I wouldn't like recommend it as a, you know, you have to read it. If you kind of miss 90s teen fiction and want to read a book that feels like it came out when you were 12, this could be a good book for you if you are my age. <laughs> um, other than that, I don't know that this is going to have that much of an appeal to actual teenagers. And the witchcraft in it isn't terribly interesting, although... The one spell that uh, Indigo actually learns is to move objects, and she starts to use that quite a lot. But it did feel like it took way too long for her to find out about her powers, to find out about witches, and then to actually get to learn some magic. So it felt like that was a little bit slow. Also, for some reason, they keep going to secondary locations. Like, a big part of the first, part, uh, first half of the book is Bishop insisting that they drive off into the middle of nowhere um, to the Hollywood sign so that you can fly Indigo from the car park up to the Hollywood sign and there explain witches. And then later on, he has to take her to his house in a completely separate part of LA so he can teach her magic. I feel like a lot of time is wasted on travelling to secondary locations for no real reason. Uh, so there's that. Um... So although I didn't really enjoy it as a book, there was definitely enough plot in there for me to get to the end and feel like I had been satisfied by the plot by the end of the novel, which, as we'll see when we get to my did not finish video, that's a rare thing these days. So I'll give the book that at least. If you have any other teen witch series you'd like to recommend to me, get in touch in any of the normal ways. And don't forget to check out the Amazon wishlist if you would like to donate me a book in these trying times. And in the meantime, I'll see you in the next one. Bye!